Now in our last section of European imperialism, as you know, we went through Africa, we went through the Muslim states and India, and now we're moving on to China. China is a little different than all the other different all the other sections that we've gone through. It's different in the sense that when China meets the Europeans in the 1800s in the age of imperialism, uh, China was pretty self-sufficient. They didn't need European markets, they didn't need or desire European technology. In fact, they were very nationalistic, so nationalistic that they had at their capital the Forbidden City, and this is the entrance of the Forbidden City, where no foreigner was allowed. Only Chinese were allowed to be part of that, and that lasted till the Qing Dynasty, which we'll be talking about. And Britain, as you know, the leaders of European imperialism, we're trying to find a way, how can we get into Chinese markets? How can we have some kind of social, economic, or pol political influence in China? Really didn't have much to offer until they colonized or imperialized India and they came across opium and they started to have that as a cash crop in India. And they introduced that to the Chinese and in the mid 1800s or I guess 1820s, 1830s maybe, um, you started to see millions and millions of Chinese get addicted to opium. Opium is much like heroin. It comes from a poppy seed and it relaxes you. And here uh, you have a man laying down smoking opium. Well, drugs are a problem and opium is a huge problem in China. You had fathers not being good fathers, mothers not being good mothers, people not being good employees. You had all these people getting high on opium, millions and millions and millions. And China's uh, economy starts to show for it, and their cultural heritage starts to struggle. And the Chinese government, which was the Qing Dynasty, they say no to China, or they say no to Britain. You're not allowed to sell us opium anymore. We are going to ban that. By the way, it was banned in Britain at the time. Well, Queen Victoria, she's the greatest drug dealer of all time. She was the one. Uh, that was for this policy of bringing in um, opium into China and what ends up happening is there's an all-out war and it's called the Opium War and it's between Britain and China over trading rights of allowing opium into China and you can see this is an embarrassing part of European especially British history where this is a war on Britain pushing for the use of Chinese people having opium. That's not a very crusade-like war to have. Well, what ends up happening is that the Chinese lose and the British win. Well, with this victory, now Britain can have a larger stake in controlling China. And this, the peace treaty that they signed gave the British uh, here's a little sense of how much power they had after the treaty. It's called the extraterritorial rights. And because of these extraterritorial rights, no British citizen could be held responsible or be charged in the Chinese court system or face Chinese punishment um, in China. So a British guy could come into China, uh, rape a Chinese um, female citizen, and the only people that could pers uh, that could charge him would be the British courts, and that really infuriates the Chinese. It's something that the Chinese do not like. You wouldn't like it if a foreigner could be in this country, but our police and our court system wouldn't be able to touch them or prosecute them. So it's called the extraterritorial rights, and now the British are in there, and the Chinese are now being imperialized. There's another way in which China is is weakened. It's called the Taiping Rebellion. This is a rebellion in the 1850s, 1860s, where you see at least, I'm using the word at least, 20 million people die. This is um, a civil war. It's a war between Chinese. And it's a total war. That is, all resources are being used to fight this. Men, women, and children are, being f are fighting in this war. You can see these are supporters of the Taiping Revolution to overthrow the Qing Dynasty. And these women are caught and they're punished th by wearing a board through their necks or around their necks. And, you know, towns would be killed. Towns would have their food taken away from them if they supported the Qing dynasty or they supported 
um, Taiping uh, Rebellion. Point is, this also made China greatly we weakened. And by the mid to late 1800s, um, the United States and other countries really want to get involved in China and they want to bring their markets and, re and get resources out of China. And here you have Uncle Sam of the United States with the key to open the lock. There's the the, oh, the key opening and here's the key and now everyone can go into China and this is the whole idea it's like the Berlin conference where all these different countries can go into Africa and carve it out and here you see the open door policy led by the United States to take that Berlin conference idea in Africa and apply it to China and you see here's Queen Victoria and Germany uh, Nicholas II of um, Russia even Japan gets involved and they're all ch carving out China and um, the Chinese are certainly not happy about this and the Chinese long for the days of when they could have a forbidden city now they're the ones only forbidden to be able to play a role and that starts to show itself with the Boxer Rebellion and the Boxer name does not come from the Chinese it comes from the British these Boxers were Chinese who who would use martial arts and just fight back and they're going after any foreigners anyone that would support these imperialistic ideas like open door policy so the boxers would go after the americans they would go after the british they wouldn't just go after the militaries they would go after anyone who supported western ideas the boxers would go after nuns here you have nuns um, in a monastery and they would be killed. The boxers would kill two-year-olds. If you were a European American you'd be killed. Um, you can see the boxers here would put heads on pikes and things like that. They're basically outnumbered but they got they want to make a point and their their point is no one is safe if you're in China. We don't want you in here if you're not Chinese. Now the name they get that name because of a British guy Saw, saw the boxers fighting and he's like why do you believe they look like boxers now and um, and the British other guys like yeah he's a bloody boxer look at him how he fight, how he fights something like that and the boxers got their name um, so the point is the boxers are put, put down what's confusing about this is the Qing dynasty doesn't support the boxers the Qing dynasty supports the foreign fighters um, as France, Britain, and the US. These foreign fighters team up with the Qing Dynasty to kick it, to defeat the boxers. Now the Qing Dynasty defeats the boxers. I mean they really want to play it safe. They're going to support the side that's going to win. And the Qing Dynasty wants to have some good relations. So they choose to join the France and the British and the US and defeating the boxers. So the if boxers are defeated and what you end up having in China is a sphere of influence. You have Britain having an economic influence in this region, France having an economic influence in this way. Even Germany gets a piece in here and Japan up in Manchuria with Russia up here um, have an influence. So China is being eaten apart slowly and it all starts with the Opium War through the Taiping Rebellion, Open Door Posse, they did try to fight back with the Boxer Rebellion, those who were strongly nationalistic, but they were defeated because there's too many people that had a stake in what to do with China. There we go.